It's California edition. My name is Brad Palmer. It's glad you're with us today. Our guest Rod Wright. He is a member of the California State Senate and within your districts we find Englewood and Ladera Heights mm -hmm. and those two communities. The students there go to Englewood Unified School District, correct, which we know has faced tremendous financial difficulties. They are one of 12 school districts on negative certification and you had to shepherd legislation to save the district from insolvency. Literally, we had to do that. And we, we look at a world where Inglewood saw uh, a 26 cents on their average daily attendance revenue cut because of the budget problems with sure. the state. And then on top of that, they lost over a third of their student body in the last three years. Combined, that drove them insolvent. Now, what's remarkable about this is that you were able to do this at the end of the session, a $55 million loan. It comes on the heels, though, of other uh, governmental entities that didn't receive such relief that did file bankruptcy. The city of San Bernardino, the city of Stockton, uh, Mammoth Lakes as well. And so that begs the question, why should Englewood Unified get a rescue and not the cities that I just mentioned? Because remember, school districts are state entities themselves, where cities are in fact separate corporations. And so because of that, the state has an obligation to the school children in Inglewood to provide an education. We don't have an obligation to maintain the city of San Bernardino or the other governmental entities that are fully incorporated themselves. And as part of that package, the superintendent of public instruction for the state, Tom Torlakson, ha has he really has come in to try to administer the the district. I mean, it's not it's an obligation. Yeah, he becomes the sole administrator of the Inglewood Unified. He has appointed someone who will be his person on the sure. on site, but the responsibility of running the school district is now with the state superintendent. So what happens to the school board? Have they been removed? They become advisory. Huh. And do they have any role in setting salaries and cutting salaries? I mean, are, are they, they have no administrative or academic authority until the loan is repaid, which is quite a stunning development. Right. See that, and again, that's one of the differences between them and the city. There is no provision for the state to say, become the city council of Long Beach or the city council of Inglewood, but that's not the case in a school district. Now, I had mentioned that 12 school districts are on negative certification. Inglewood uh, was one of them. Is the state prepared to rescue the other 11 or ones that we don't know about well, yet? Well, remember, Brad, we actually are going to borrow the money for Inglewood at market rate, and the state has an obligation pursuant to the Constitution to do that. So it's not a question of... There's no option. There's no option. It's not a question of if we'll do it, it's when. And there'll be other school districts that are going to be like Englewood. But as I understand it, even though Englewood's in the news, this has happened before. Yes. I mean, as we speak today, I understand the superintendent of public instruction operates other school districts right. around the state. That's correct. Uh, and have those run smoothly? Have they gone back to local control ultimately? Both. Uh, Oakland just went back to local control. Oh, Oakland, that's a big uh, one. Compton went back to local control. They were both uh, taken over and then restored. Uh, Kings County up in Northern California is currently with the superintendent, and West Contra Costa is currently with the superintendent. So there is precedent. But my question then is why did this this takeover gets such huge play? I mean, I, what was it? I think it, it in light of the current budget and, and fiscal issues facing the state, this becomes one of, of, of the side effects that you have school districts that will not be able to fiscally go right. forward because, the, again, the combination in their case of declining enrollment and the loss of revenue limit revenue was too much for them to take and on. And we know there are some community college districts that are in trouble. I've got one of those too. The, the Compton Community College District is currently under the supervision of El Camino. Right, it was taken over. But, but, that, that was a, but again, that was a fiscal issue, and right. so they were deemed insolvent. San Francisco City, Cuesta mm -hmm. College, and these are mm -hmm. tough times for educational institutions. Yes. But you're looking for a way for the state to take in more revenue. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this for the last couple of years. You've been very passionate about it. Uh, it didn't get out of the legislature again this year, and what I'm discussing is internet gaming mm -hmm. and the ability for the state of California to tax internet gaming. Right. Talk to me about why you believe that is a viable source of revenue for the state. Well, again, it, it, it's a source of revenue because it's already taking place. I wouldn't say that I want the state to be in the gambling business 
as a means of supporting ourselves. But in this case, you've already got 700,000 people playing for which we receive no revenue. How, I mean, isn't gambling illegal in California? No. It's, so well, other a, than, than, than the tribal lands. No, actually, here, here's where it gets a little convoluted. The internet allows for people to go online and play. The federal government would dictate whether or not something was specifically illegal. There was a, a bill called Uija that passed the federal government that allows for the state to provide that game. It is not illegal currently to play. The problem becomes how you move the money. So I presume that if you take gains from gambling, you're supposed to declare those gains yes. on your taxes. Right. Whether people are doing that, that's another conversation. But explain what you are looking to do. What we're looking to do is to have a game that would be regulated because what we lose now is also consumer protection. It's kind of like you put your money into this computer and you have no idea where the operator is. He could be in the Isle of Man, he could be in the Cayman so, Islands, so literally, he could be anywhere in the world. So literally it would be like a state lottery where the state would operate internet gambling? We would, in effect, franchise it out to people who would buy licenses and they would pay $30 million to the state to hold a license. And in exchange for that, we would regulate them and we would be able to monitor what they did, but we would also get a piece of the action from the games that are played. One would think that with a cash-strapped state, that would be an idea that folks would jump on. Maybe there are moral objections, but we've not seen success. The challenge becomes, and this has been a challenge around the country, is that the incumbent gaming interests are themselves fearful that this might interrupt their brick and mortar facilities. And I think it's fair to say in California, those incumbents are the tribes. Tribes and card clubs. So there, there are 80, there are 89 card clubs in the state of California. We know the tribes have been, let's say, very generous as it relates to their contributions to politicians. Right. Is that the problem? I mean, that, that's certainly a problem. And some of the card clubs have some concerns. Some of the horse racing industry folks have had some well, concerns. Well, couldn't they become the franchisees? Well, see, what we did in the bill that I crafted was to say, you know what, everybody will have an opportunity to play. So we would say the tribes could play, that the card clubs could play, that the horse racing people could all play. All of the incumbent gamers would be eligible to become a license holder under the bill that I proposed. So where is this bill getting killed? Why well, is it the, constantly... The, what, what we're doing is... As we're moving forward and more tribes understand it, when we first proposed it three years ago, everyone hated it. We now have got it almost 50-50. Okay. I think next year we might be at the critical mass where people now understand enough about it that they're prepared to go out and play the game and get in. Most of those tribes now have partners, and as they get partners who explain the business model to them and the synergy that it can create where someone who's playing online brings his winnings to a tribal casino to get cash. Oh, that's in interesting. So, Any states do this now? Not yet. New Jersey? Uh, New, Jersey, yeah, New right. Jersey and Nevada both have ordinances in place. They have not yet launched the game. Nevada is actually, at this point, uh, getting people licensed and ramped up. The challenge with Nevada is that Nevada is banking on the federal government changing the law to let them play outside of the state of Nevada. There are not enough people in Nevada to make a game. So, so, but can you even put a barrier, a frontier on the internet so that someone outside of Nevada Here's the, the, the play? current federal law requires that a state that sets up a game has to provide the ability to ensure that those players are within the state. Is that even possible? Oh, yeah, it is. It because, is? Because in, in the internet game, you'll also have to verify that the player is over 21. You'll have to verify yeah, a number right. of other things. Right. And that the person is who you say it is. It's not that difficult because you can verify ID and other things and they will post money in a cage that will all be verified before they play. So this bill's coming back in 2013. We're working on it right now. No doubt. Absolutely. Okay, his name is Rod Wright. He's a member of the California State Senate. My name is Brad Palmer. Thank you so much for watching California Edition. What was the first nation to pass laws relating to online gaming? Antigua and Barbuda? The Cayman Islands, Island of Man, or Sao Tome. In 1994, Antigua and Barbuda became the first nation to pass laws relating to online gaming. 
You're watching California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer. It's glad you're with us. Our guest, Doug Halbert, he is the city prosecutor in the beautiful city of Long Beach. And I want to speak with you about what we know as gang injunctions. I remember, I think it was in the 90s, it was a very hot topic because the question was, is it constitutional to prevent folks from congregating, assembling together. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. Give us a background on that, and then we'll talk about what's happening in Long Beach. Well, thank you for having me on Please. the show. And uh, you're right, when gang injunctions came out, there was some controversy because it was new and people didn't understand it. Since the 1990s, uh, there have been court rulings that have confirmed that uh, gang injunctions are a legal and effective tool to deal with uh, gangs in, in certain areas, in urban areas. And while congregating in a park might not seem like a hostile act, when they're gang members and when it's a park that they've claimed as their territory and they use it to the exclusion of all others, mm -hmm. that congregating is actually, it's more than that. It's sending a message to the public that this is their turf, this is their area. So breaking up the ability of gangs to congregate in public areas is actually an effective public safety tool. And so how do gang injunctions operate today? Well, today, uh, first of all, an injunction has to be secured from the court. So the court has to approve it. Prosecutors, law enforcement officers, they can't uh, get a gang injunction right. without going through a judicial process. So there have to be declarations, often by experts and those who have firsthand knowledge of the gangs. Once the, uh, the court proceedings are handled and the judge gets to the final decision of whether or not to issue a gang injunction, there's always, uh, the, the gang has to be named in the lawsuit. And there's, in every injunction I've seen, a target area, an area where that gang has exhibited its, its control and has demonstrated that that is its territory, it's claimed that territory. So it applies to the active gang members in that territory. And the last thing is they Please. have to get notice that they're on the injunction. They have to be actually served with formal process before it can be enforced against them. Once they've gotten notice, after the court proceeding is all done, then law enforcement and prosecutors can use a gang injunction against them. And so, for example, if someone is driving through a gang injunction area and they see gang members congregating, what happens? Well, if, if a law enforcement officer in Long Beach sees people in the target area, whether it's And this is park, not just Long Beach. I mean, many cities in California have this. Th that's correct. Actually, Los Angeles, I think, was the pioneer right. in this. In Southern California, California probably, we probably have more gang injunctions in Southern California than the rest of the nation. And, and to be quite honest, I think there's a reason for that. Gangs have kind of grown from here and some of the gangs in Southern California have now grown and have branches in other states and in other countries. And they've been really fostered, incubated often in Central America. Yeah, some of those gangs are coming mm -hmm. up here and they're merging uh, mm -hmm. as, as, as we've seen. But a gang injunction is just a tool. It doesn't actually uh, solve uh, a crime problem in a community. It just gives law enforcement the ability. For example, if a person is in violation of the injunction, law enforcement can arrest that person. Now what happens when that person is placed under arrest is the officer has the right at that point to inquire deeper and find out what they're doing there, ask them questions. Sometimes we find out that a crime is about to occur. Mm. Sometimes these gang members who are arrested on the injunction turn out to have evidence in their pockets of some other crime. And so it helps the police not just to deal with the congregating in the park, that's part of it, but it helps them address the whole gang problem. And over time, that gang stops uh, using public spaces. They stop intimidating people in public because they know if they do that, they're gonna get arrested. How do you prevent it though from being used as just a method of harassment? Well, every injunction is different. The terms are different. The people it applies to is different. It's my duty, I think, as a prosecutor to make sure that our injunction, which we go to court and we get from the judge, right. we get that from the judge. In my view, that it's our responsibility to make sure that once the injunction is in place, it's enforced properly. So we do training with law enforcement. We work very closely with law enforcement to make sure that they're not contacting people that aren't on the injunction. And we provide them the information to how to run a background check so they know before they approach that person whether or not they're on the gang injunction. Now, I was surprised to learn that recently, uh, none other than the NAACP honored you uh, not that you don't deserve the honor, but for some efforts you are making to help folks get off gang injunction lists. Well, what's happened historically is communities have gotten injunctions. They've served people or named people in those injunctions, so the terms apply to those people. 
but they don't have a mechanism for removing people from an injunction when they've left the gang life entirely. And why is that so important? Because you explained to me, in terms of background checks, it can be just critical. Well, I, I, th I think it's a couple things. Number one, your injunction is not going to have credibility unless it truly focuses on the most active gang members. So it's important to take those that aren't in the gang anymore, who are no longer involved. Some of them are in prison for life, for mm -hmm. example. They don't need to be on the gang injunction anymore. But here's the thing, when you've left the gang, and some people leave the Southern California, they've moved to other areas, and it turns out that the gang injunction shows up on their rap sheet. And so they may be stopped by someone years after they were served with an injunction, long after they've left the gang. Likely and cleaned up, we would hope. They could, be, they could be fully employed, have a family, and the gang injunction follows them around. Well, we don't want that to happen. If they're no longer involved in the gang, uh, there's no reason to enforce the gang injunction against them. So we've created an opt-out program, and I'm working with uh, several of the nonprofits here in Long Beach to identify people who may have been served on a gang injunction, but who no longer should appropriately be uh, held subject to the so, terms. So, for example, let's say that you have moved to Pittsburgh, and you're applying for a job, and there's a, bank, a background check done on you. What will come up through the Department of Justice is your gang injunction. Well, sure. Any any arrests and, and convictions, wants and warrants will come up, and also the terms of this injunction may come up uh, on the rap sheet. So if you can't explain it to them and they say, well, you should go back and figure out what the problem right. is and have it removed, we have the ability to remove them from the gang injunction list. So and, talk and to us about this opt-out program. It's, as I understand it, very innovative, and the NAACP agreed as such. Well, I think it's a good, it's the right thing to do. It's a good program. We look for four things from people who want to get off the mm -hmm. injunction list. First, we look for two community sponsors. And that's because they may tell me they're going to comply with this uh, program, but I want them to also tell it to two people that they respect in the community that they do feel bad about uh, a line to if it turns out of that course. they're not sincere about it. So they have to come forward with two community sponsors. They have to come forward with either work full time or school full time or some combination of the two. They have to do community service. That's the third uh, criteria. And the fourth criteria is they have to completely disassociate from the gang. If they're still hanging out with uh, known members of the gang, they're not going to qualify for the opt out program. And as I understand it, as we speak today, you've had a few individuals, I believe three, that have successfully participated in the opt out program. We, we have, and, and these are these are good success stories. These are people who who outgrew the gang life, uh, and and some of them were not the leaders of the gangs. Uh, they were just uh, people who got swept right. up in it when they were younger. Uh, some of them have uh, families now. They've moved on with their lives. They're working full time, and they're finding that the gang injunction is still following them. Right. And it could create a problem for them. Obviously, these terms are very uh, very cumbersome and burdensome on people, uh, as they should be. So to have them removed from the gang injunction so the terms don't apply, they would go through my office, we screen them. Often they're brought to us with a nonprofit who's willing to vouch for that person's sincerity. And the community service sometimes is done at that nonprofit. And you had one individual that chose to join the military. I mean, that's, that's quite a success story. We had someone come forward with uh, an Army recruiter. The Army recruiter had said, we screen this person. He's appropriate. Uh, he had some minor uh, violations of the law years ago. Right. Uh, but this gang injunction is showing up on his rap sheet, and that will prevent him from serving his country uh, in the Army. He came forward and was one of the two community sponsors that said, I'm going to vouch I for this I think that's a pretty good one. One. Credibility and sincerity. It was very good. We accepted it and we went through uh, the program and he's, he's doing very well and uh, I, I don't believe this person will ever be uh, a problem and in Long Beach. So are individuals approaching, is there some reticence to participate in these four items? Well, obviously it's not easy to qualify. We wanted to have a bar that was high enough that it allowed the people who are sincere to qualify but to keep out those who really do still have a foot in the gang. Uh, and we, I think this criteria gives us the flexibility to deal with, with people. And we have had many people inquire, but like I said, we've only had three people go the distance to well, actually come forward. I congratulate you on your honor with the NAACP. His Thank name you. is Doug Halbert. He is the Lo Long Beach City Prosecutor. My name is Brad Palmer. We'll be right back on California Edition. How many cases does the Long Beach Prosecutor's Office handle on average each year? 10,000? 12,000, 14,000, or 16,000. The Long Beach Prosecutor's Office handles approximately 14,000 cases each year. 
This is California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest today is Jerry Shipsky. She is a member of the Long Beach City Council, and I'm always glad when you join us, you give us such important information. And recently, and it's so very important that we do this, we had our great shakeout. Um, and the reality is we need to be prepared for an earthquake. I love that you say shake out, don't freak out. I have two daughters and one of them freaks out at the mere shake. And so it's so important. Talk to us about the great shake out. Uh, it's an annual event that has been put together um, across the state of California to remind people um, that a big earthquake is coming right. uh, and to be prepared. And what their focus is, is that if you do feel an earthquake that you get underneath a table um, and that you you hold on to the uh, to the legs and that ride it out. If it happens in the middle of the night, stay in your bed, put a pillow over your head. You're much likely to survive than if you're trying to jolt out of bed. Probably what about trip. going to the doorway? Is that a good idea or is that a myth? It's it's not a good idea because many people have been injured as the door swung oh, my, with right. the shaking of the home. So they say, um, and that's what the drill on October 18th was. It was about you know reminding everyone get under that table, hold on, uh, and you know you'll be covered. I have to admit something. I think it's fair to say that our earthquake preparedness kit probably not updated. Probably not updated. No. Talk to us about the importance of those kits, what should be in them, and, and especially since yeah. you're a nurse, right. and so you know about medical survival. Well, first, first responders, police and fire, have said to us repeatedly mm -hmm. what they learned in Katrina. Mm -hmm. It's no longer a three-day on your own. That's it's the a seven-day. Right. And all people say, well, we're not going to have a Katrina. But with an earthquake, it'll be very similar. Um, city managers out in uh, the valley found that when they had the very large windstorms uh, a year or two ago, right. they were cut off because That's you true. get cut off from electricity, lines were down, you couldn't pass on streets, so you couldn't get to work, you couldn't get to ATMs, it takes electricity to move gas. You mentioned ATMs. Someone told me, I can't remember, be sure to have cash. and. Don't have just 20s because the 20 is going to buy you a bottle of water. <laughs> if that's all well, you, you got. Well, you don't want to use a 20 right. bottle of water, but, but that's what will happen. But literally, there will Absolutely. be change. Absolutely. And, and I don't want to be doomsday. -ish, no, no, but no, no. I think the projections are because of the amount of oil lines and other things that the fire and police will be attending to major explosions uh, like in San Francisco and fires. And so that means the rest of us will be on our own. So you have to have an emergency kit. I want to talk about water. Water is very important. I, I, let's face it, a human can live without food right. for quite some time. Right. I mean, weeks, if not months. How long can you live without water? Not very long because you can get severely dehydrated. And the problem is it depends on when the earthquake hits uh, and where you are. Um, it, they, they're viewing that the epicenter will probably be Palm Springs. Mm. God help us if you're in July of or course. August in Palm Springs and there's no air conditioning and, and you don't have access to water. So you have to have water. And what we're suggesting is people recycle it. In other words, buy some bottles, very large bottles, use them up, move in some more. So it, it stays fresh. And for you need one it. person, how much water should you have? Um, you should have it, well, you know, we're recommending that you have eight to 16 eight ounce glasses per person per a day person. just to drink. And that's not for hygiene, that's simply for drinking. So that's I would double that amount per person in the house. Then you have pets as well, and people sometimes forget. So when you say about the emergency kit, make sure uh, you take care of your pets, you get extra pet food, uh, and if they have medication, and as well as yourself, if you have medication, get an extra supply of it, because it Nurse may Shipsky, be a while. please. <laughs> Nurse Shipsky, tell, us, tell <laughs> us about medication, because that is one area yeah. where people, look, I mean, if you're diabetic, you'll have enough insulin, but you know, people- Well, you may not, because if the refrigerator goes down- Good point. Uh, insulin is refrigerated, so you've gotta be See? careful and figure out what you're gonna do for a backup. All these things we don't think of because right now we have ready access. You run out of food, you run out of water or toilet paper or whatever, you just go up to the store. You're that not going anywhere. may be a problem if the roads are impassable, if the stores have been destroyed, if there's no electricity for a while. Those are serious things that we have to start thinking about. Speaking of medicine, we've talked yes. about this before. I love this. Thank you. I love this. This is called the vial of life. Tell us about the vial of life. Well, life stands for life, uh, uh, life saving information for emergencies, and it's a project that has been uh, used across the United States for years. 
what you can do is you take the medical information from yeah, inside the yeah, bio please. and you fill it out. You put it back in here and you put it in your refrigerator because everyone has a refrigerator. There's a magnet that you put on the front. It tells paramedics, hey, when I come to this house, I can go in that refrigerator, open this up. I will have a list of your medications. I will know what your medical condition is, who your doctor is your contact information, I can start treating you immediately. The paramedics are carrying these with them. They are taking them out when they go on call. We're distributing uh, for anyone who wants right. them. We have a website. It's lbvialoflife.com. People can get more information on that. My mother recently had a health crisis. Fortunately, we were there. Yeah. She became unconscious. Exactly. If we had not been there, I, I don't know if the medical professionals would have known what was going on. And so that's why it is so incredibly important that we be prepared with these types of valuable information. I want to get a sense from you about whether people realize that the Again, we're not doomsdayers about you know, the importance of this. I live on the west side of Los Angeles, and a couple uh, months ago, there were those series of tremors in right. Beverly Hills, right. you know, not far from where I live. In the Imperial um, County, there was these series of tremors. Just a while ago, like Elsinore had. Right, been. and what's interesting is, on the one hand, I feel as if, oh, I like those tremors because they're releasing pressure, but that's not necessarily true. We know that. Right. I mean, so when you talk to people, are they, taking this very seriously? Some people are. Some people, um, you know, we, we deny that there's going to be anything bad happening in California, uh, except now that we've seen the price of gas. I think people are oh starting my, to yes. be believers no, that the bad no things can happen. But then there's a whole group that says, listen, if something happens, fire and police will be there. And I just put on a, an event called Let's Get Ready Long Beach, and we're mm -hmm. going to follow up in um, March because it's the anniversary, the 80th anniversary of the Long Beach earthquake. Tell us about it. I love your history <laughs> lessons. Begin. <laughs> yeah, March uh, 1933, we had a 6.3 earthquake, um, which was devastating for the city because um, the construction was not what it is today. As a result, we have great earthquake um, construction. The problem was the schools particularly were affected. 98% of the schools were destroyed. You're kidding. And students had to be um, taught in tents or out at Recreation Park or out in the grass for two years. It took that long to rebuild all the schools. We won't have that problem again because we do have really secure schools. So what we're trying to do is just remind people it impacted Long Beach greatly. We are on the um, Newport Inglewood Fault. We are adjacent, not too far away from the San Andreas. This is earthquake country, and that while that was a great historical event because Long Beach survived and really became the model for architecture after that, um, it, we, it could happen again. And what is, as I understand it, we really aren't at that much risk for tsunamis. Is that accurate? We we don't know. I mean, I would I wouldn't want to throw that in the mix it now because then people I think at some point get so overwhelmed. It's like, well, I can't do anything about it anyway. Um, but we always have to be aware, and I have to tell you that's one of the safety valves we have with the breakwater, and that is exactly right. one of the reasons that breakwater was built because if you look historically at photos of Long Beach, uh, the downtown area was consistently flooded and wiped out with uh, with high waves. Uh, homes were destroyed. Uh, boats were destroyed. Destroyed. So that's how that breakwater came into being um, because of Long Beach's locations. Have you heard any nervousness about what's going on at San Onofre? No, only, if, only um, you know, I was contacted from Southern California Edison right. um, because they're concerned that um, it's disrupted now another source of electricity. Right. And then I just read that Diablo Ca uh, Canyon um, reactor was shut down a couple of days ago. And that can and happen. they don't right. know why. Right. They don't right. know why. So um, I, I think this, we're having a public discussion about how do we get our electricity. And as you know, in California, um, Edison and others are, are really under the gun to make sure that they don't get it from polluting sources. So nuclear energy, they're saying, is one of them. But It is ironic. In the 70s, it was all no nukes, and now we kind of, it all comes well, back. Well, there are a lot of people that are still very concerned, especially who live in Orange County. They're extremely right. concerned about uh, the future of that uh, reactor. So it, I think we're going to see some robust a debate. We still need to look for alternate energy sources such as solar um, and other ways to generate electricity. Um, so it's, it's going to be a long-term debate about how we get it. Her name is Jerry Shipsky. Always valuable information. She is a member of the Long Beach City Council. She's a nurse. She's a professor. She's an attorney. My name is Brad Pomerantz. Thanks for joining us on California Edition.